I'm Scott. I'm Bill. And, and we're, we're the, the Trade, Trade Guys. Guys. You're listening to The Trade Guys, a podcast produced by CSIS where we talk about trade in terms that everyone can understand. I'm H. Andrew Schwartz, and I'm here with Scott Miller and Bill Reinch, the CSIS Trade Guys. On this episode of The Trade Guys, we'll talk about the recent elections in India, Mexico, and South Africa. Plus, we'll talk about the Red Sea shipping crisis. And finally, we'll get to Ambassador Tai's recent op-ed in the Financial Times, all on the next episode of The Trade Guys. Guys, we've got some really highly anticipated electoral results that came in internationally. We got elections in India, Mexico, and South Africa, all important to trade in one way or another. Let's start with India. How did that election go? It didn't go as expected, that's for sure. Well, I've been thinking about this, and it's taken me three days to find a, a common thread amongst the three that happened recently, which are India, Mexico, and South Africa. And, and if I'm not mistaken, it took until you got yourself in the pool to exercise for you to come up with analysis. That is correct. It was doing, doing laps. I had an epiphany, and I figured out, I think, what they have in common. The irony is that it won't make any difference, but that's we'll get to that. Well, one of them was a surprise, and that's the one you mentioned, India, where Bodai did not do nearly as well as people expected him to do, lost his single party's majority. His coalition will continue to govern. He'll continue to be prime minister, but lost a lot of votes. And what was important here was that it really was a, a triumph of economics over religion. It was people, and it was poor people primarily, including poor Hindus and poor Muslims, voting their pocketbooks because he had promised jobs and it promised a whole variety of benefits and had not delivered. And I think that it caught up with him. And his campaign was a much more divisive one on religious grounds, sort of Hindus versus Muslims. And what I think it demonstrated, which was kind of reassuring in a way, was that voters didn't really care about that as much as he thought they would. And what they did care about was, did they have food on the table? And did they have jobs? And how was the economy going? I think the irony is that they voted against him because they were unhappy with that. It's not at all clear that the economic policy of India is going to change very much, despite the election results. The coalition that he put together for the election is going to be there. There will be some differences. What always happens with coalition governments is it takes longer to make decisions. So for a prime minister whose time has been characterized by strong leadership and and quick decision making, I think it's going to be complicated for him. But I think he'll still pursue pretty much the same economic policies that he's been pursuing, despite the message from the electorate that they want something different. Mexico was, again, it was economics. This is a common thread. It was a triumph of people that appreciated what AMLO had done. And what AMLO has done in his almost six-year term is provide a lot of benefits to poor Mexicans. And he's promoted unions, you know, actual independent labor unions, and he's tried to promote economic growth and he's provided a lot of benefits to the poor. Essentially, his party was rewarded for that. He couldn't run again, but his candidate, Claudia Scheinbaum, is going to be the new president. And I think we'll probably pursue pretty much the same policies that Emlo pursued during his term, which are pro-labor, pro-worker, pro-poor people policies. I think she is more of a technocrat than he did. By all accounts, had a successful time as mayor of Mexico City, which is a city with a whole boatload of problems. And she may apply more of a, I guess, an engineering, if you will, or technocratic approach to governance. But people are not expecting, like as in India, major changes in policy. South Africa was also predictable, not a surprise. People have been saying for nearly a year that the ANC was going to lose its majority, and it did. It ended up with, I think, somewhere around 40, 42% of the vote. The next government is not clear yet because they have to form a coalition. One of the interesting things is whether they'll form a coalition with the Democratic Alliance, which is actually the white party. It's not entirely white. It's not entirely white, and it's pro-business. It is more pro-business, yes. But I think the, the reason for the decline in the ANC's fortune was economics. They haven't delivered on growth. They haven't delivered on wages. They haven't delivered on prosperity for the poor people. 
In all three cases, in Mexico, it was an affirmation. And in the other two cases, it was a rejection of governments that failed to deliver on economic promises that they've made. This is where Scott jumps in and says, it's the economy, stupid. Well, uh, look, I think people all over the world are voting in elections this year. Yeah. And a lot of them vote their pocketbook. I know that certainly happens in America. Uh, Economy and jobs is usually the number one issue in polling. And while I don't know how good polling is worldwide, people want better lives and they'll vote for them if they get a chance. So, look, I think in India that it was a disappointing result. But but look, I think Modi is still... Last I saw was a survey of world leaders and their, their domestic polling. And at that time, Modi was far and away the most popular world leader among his voters. He was in the 60s, so pretty good approval rating. At that time, the lowest was Chancellor Schultz of Germany. I think his approval rating was like 16%. So he was down in the area of dandruff or, you know, dryer <laughs> lint. I mean, it was really a sad blue rating, but it actually made President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau look good by comparison. So, you know, it's tough out there and uh, the economy is important. For me in India, India is of interest to American trade policy because India is the alternative to China if you're looking for scale. They have some things going for them. Modi has done a good job with investment, particularly in infrastructure, which is helpful. They've got a skilled and younger workforce. Demographics are in their favor. They have issues with their regulatory and what used to be called ease of doing business. And so there's a lot of room for reform. I agree with Bill. Reform is a lot harder when you have a coalition government. But the BJP, the Modi's party, went from 303 seats to 240. 272 is a majority. So they're going to have a coalition partner in a pro-market, market-friendly party called the National Democratic Alliance. We'll see what happens. Mexico is also important because that's the alternative to China, thanks to its proximity to the U.S. and to USMCA. So important conclusions there. I think in Mexico, Bill's right about AMLO's agenda and how popular it was among key voters. For me, the key question on Mexico's ability to be the resilient neighbor and an alternative to long-haul imports from China is whether it can create confidence for investors. Mexico has reasonably well-skilled workforce. They have a workforce where manufacturing is, is seen as an aspirational job. It's seen as a good job. It's not denigrated the way it is often in, in America. It's seen as a thing of the, thing of the past. And so their workforce is skilled in places, but getting the most out of Mexico will require in private investment. And the the record of AMLO and his party is somewhat sketchy there. So we'll have to see we'll have to see whether security conditions improve. Personal security has often been a problem in Mexico, continues to be. So I want to ask you guys a couple questions about Mexico. One, following the election of Claudia Sheinbaum, peso dropped, economy in the immediate sense, was suffering. So that's one thing. Why do you think that is? And will it rebound? Two, you mentioned China, Scott. China obviously wants to do a lot of business in Mexico. The United States wouldn't be happy about that. What do we think Shane Baum is inclined to do vis-a-vis China and the United States? Well, look, I think the peso is a temporary drop, much like the same thing happened with, uh, with India because of the surprise There was a drop in the stock market, in this case, in India, which quickly rebounded and found its footing again. So I don't think anything fundamental happened to the peso with the election. But look, China is an important player for all these economies. China, is because of their sheer scale, is a major trading partner for everyone. The closer you are to them, the the larger a partner you are. And Mexico has been inclined to to make agreements with China, to, to utilize Chinese imports in their, as intermediate goods. They have a lot less uh, neuralgia about it than Americans do. And I think Chinese goods have found their way, finished products have found their way into the Mexican market and been very successful. And Chinese intermediate products are quite important to Mexico competitiveness. So my guess is that there will be a reasonable embrace. And to my mind, Mexico-U.S. relationships are always prickly. They have been since basically since the continent was settled. <laughs> and uh, I don't expect a change in that. 
And it, it's less so with a more distant partner like uh, China. So I, I imagine that we'll see a lot of Chinese goods enter Mexico for further processing. And I think we, we're we going to have to find a way to live with that. Well, I think the Mexican ad toward China has been complicated. And Amla went back and forth about that. Sometimes he welcomed them in and sometimes he didn't. And I'm not sure there was a clear signal being said. I think there's countries that have welcomed Chinese investment, particularly in Latin America, have not always been enthusiastic about the result. Sometimes they have been, but oftentimes they found themselves with taking in a lot of imports and the additional manufacturing and job creation that they expected didn't always pan out. And I think there's some sensitivity to that in Mexico. In addition, I think Scott's right about the U.S.-Mexican relationship, which has a very long history, and it's frequently not been a particularly good one. And it's probably going to continue to be complicated, certainly on the economic front, because the Mexicans are going to be under pressure from, certainly from the Biden administration, I imagine from Trump too, if he wins, to not allow Mexico to become a breeding ground, if you will, for imports of the United States. You've got a lot of Chinese car companies thinking about investing in Mexico. Not many of them have actually done it yet, but they're thinking about it. And you've already got, I think, the the Biden folks telling the Mexicans that if you think that Chinese EVs are going to get in via Mexico, you're mistaken. We'll take steps to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's going to make the, the relationship more complicated. It also, it'll depend in part on, on how the Chinese model any business plans for what they do in Mexico. Will they actually build cars there with sufficient Mexican content to get them over the various restrictions in USMCA and the various guardrails that have been put into the Inflation Reduction Act? Or will they just try to make, just assemble cheap Chinese cars and hope for the best? If the United States takes no action, that might end up being a loophole because as near as I can tell, if you want to qualify your cars for the various benefits of USMCA, which is duty-free, or the various tax credits in IRA, then there are very stringent content requirements that the Chinese probably will not be able to meet unless they basically make the battery in Mexico with without any Chinese ingredients. But if you don't bother with any of that, and just make cars in Mexico, the standard rule of content is going to be the 51% rule. And if it's got 51% content, it can get into the United States with a 2.5% tariff. And it won't be eligible for the other benefits, but if you're making a ten or $20,000 car, which the Chinese are, 2.5% is not going to keep them out of the U.S. market. So I think the United States needs to think fairly hard about how they want to handle this. The Mexicans also need to think fairly hard about what kind of industry they want to develop inside Mexico. Uh, just a footnote, which is Mexico and the United States have been our large trading partners with each other, and it goes well beyond Chinese electric cars, right? There's a lot of two-way trade that is vitally important. Supply chains that that that, that combine products from the two countries are are prevalent in our economy and and Create great value for Americans and create a lot of American jobs. So there's a there's a much bigger relationship here than than cars alone or electric vehicles from China alone. Can I come back to India for a second? Yeah, of course. Uh, I'm not as optimistic as it Scott sounded about it. The BJP plan seems to try to turn India into a manufacturing hub in the same way that China has done it. And there's I think there's an, a lot of economists who are skeptical that that will work. It's an economy that has encumbered itself for 80 years, more than 80 years, in a network of regulatory maladministration, basically, that makes it very complicated to start up businesses and complicated to run businesses. It's kind of built into the government mentality in India of all parties to do things that way, have a highly regulated model, and require a lot of permits, a lot of permissions to do things that other countries prefer to let be determined by the market. We'll see if, if the, if the Modi, next Modi government is in a position to, or willing to, to change uh, that. 
the more interesting question, I think, is a number of, of observers of the Indian economy have suggested that their future might lie more in services because they really have a comparative advantage in services. I think software, software development, but also call centers and a whole range of, of things that they do already globally where, and they do very well. And that it might be better in the long term if the government tries to play to its strengths rather than to play to its weaknesses. Well, did Bill, you're right. That's definitely the area in which their workforce is most skilled. And you're also right about regulation. I mean, back for about 20 years, the World Bank published a genuinely useful report called Doing Business. And it showed basically what it cost in terms of time and money to basically open, operate, and expand a business. It was a genuinely useful report. It was so useful that the World Bank stopped publishing it in 2021 or so. This was an area where you could look at what it actually took to do things in India, and uh, it was quite burdensome. Guys, I want to move to another part of the world. We've been talking for months now about the Red Sea shipping crisis. Why are shipping costs rising again six months after the Houthis began their strikes and in the process uh, launched this crisis? Well, it's uh, it's a case of interrelationships that what you have is, uh, first of all, the higher costs are predominantly for container shipping. And container shipping is a very important share of total global shipping. But uh, there's an interesting split right at the moment between what the industry calls dry bulk, which would be commodities, steel, whatever it is, things sh- things not shipped in the the 40-foot standard containers. Wheat, grains, you know, all, like that. all kinds of things travel. Oil, yeah, big one uh, that travel as dry bulk or as it's known. Those costs are relatively stable. It is container shipping, and, and container shipping was particularly targeted by the Houthi tribesmen in Yemen for attacks in the Red Sea and has – initially, it was high insurance costs that caused the diversion from – so if you're leaving Rotterdam for for Shanghai, the long way around is around the Cape of Good Hope. It's, a I think, 10 to 20 days longer, a true bit of voyage than going through the through the Red Sea or starting at the Suez Canal, at the Mediterranean to the Suez Canal. But the longer the, the ships are en route, the, the more containers you need to supply the entire system. So container shortages and Secondary effects happen, port backups, all, all sorts of things. It's it's a, it's a it's a major logistics problem, but it's one of the reasons you're seeing the the higher higher container shipping costs. And this does it looks to me to be nowhere near a settlement, mostly because the people who are targeting container vessels are not part of any negotiations or peace agreement. They're funded from Iran, principally, as I understand it. They have their own grievances, uh, but what they're doing is definitely disruptive. And it's it's a it's a tough thing for American consumers because, look, new tariffs on Chinese goods plus uh, continued tariffs on a number of important products plus higher shipping costs, that, that leads to inflation. And so it, it, here here is a direct example of where logistics costs can get translated very quickly to higher costs for consumers. So. I don't see any end in sight. Bill, you may have more optimism. Or- I think you've covered it very well. Insurance is also an issue because these kinds of attacks cause insurance rates to go up significantly. And that often is a determinative factor in, in a lot of economic activity. So I think that Scott's right. The efforts to put the Houthis out of business or at least out of the shipping attack business so far have not been entirely successful. The British and the U.S. Air Forces have attacked various locations in Yemen, and I assume that's made a difference, but it hasn't shut everything down completely. So I think we're just going to have to endure this for a while. I mean, the, uh, the answer, I think, permanent answer, or the long-term answer is, is a peace agreement, which, uh, and you're right, the Houthis are not part of that. They just they were going to have to react to uh, the external events that are occurring. So I think we're going to see more of this and it's going to make things more expensive. It's going to create shortages. It's going to take things longer to get here. And we're heading, we are now, if, if you think about sort of supply chain cycles, we are now about to head into the uh, school starting and then holiday rush 
where you know all the retail uh, outlets, both brick and mortar stores and and other places, are stocking up on stuff that the kids need for school, which means new clothes and also new books, pens, all the stuff that goes along with 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 that, but mostly clothes and shoes. And they're trying to get all those in before Labor Day, basically, so that uh, they'll be available. And then as soon as they dealt with that, then you're going to have the Christmas rush, the holiday rush. And that stuff needs to get in in October and November if it's going to be available when and where people want to buy it. So we're heading into the time of year when the demand for containers, demand for shipping is going to be peak. And that's going to probably raise prices further and make the delays more problematic. Guys, finally, we have time to talk about one last thing, and that is Ambassador Catherine Tai's op-ed in the Financial Times, where she argues that economic policy should work on behalf of working people rather than in service of trickle-down economies and deferring to the wisdom of markets. She put an emphasis on a new social contract. What does this all mean in practice? I think we both have a rant on that, but I, I'm going to let Scott go first. Well, I read this op-ed uh, with great interest and and wondered if uh, Ambassador Tai had borrowed Senator Warren's speechwriter, or perhaps uh, the AI she used was trained by Senator Warren's speechwriter. It, it was a, a classic progressive speech of fuzzy aspirations, but I, I couldn't actually find a concrete policy direction anywhere from it. Now, look, I want to support working people. And the Bureau of Labor Statistics said last month that there were over 140 million Americans in their employment survey. So there are a lot of working Americans, I have no, working people. I have no idea who, she's, who she means. Does she include tech workers? Does she include farmers? Does she include people who make their living providing services with imported goods? I, I, I just don't know who she means by that. I know what that what that catchphrase means if it were spoken by a union leader, as it's, it's familiar language in that context. But as a matter of American policy, I don't know what I don't know what it means. I don't know what what she has in mind when she wants to configure or reconfigure the American economy. And she talks about economic opportunities and economic justice. And certainly, there are parts of trade policy which are about fairness, things like non-discrimination, most favored nation treatment. So it's part of her, her, her policy toolkit. But frankly, the examples are all after the fact. The only way we know that something is, is part of her preferred policy is to look at it after it's been implemented. She, I couldn't find anything that she proposed as part of a practical agenda that would accomplish what she wanted. Look, in my mind, the U.S. Trade Representative has one of the most pragmatic jobs in the cabinet. He or she negotiates trade agreements, principally. Most of them see their job as removing barriers to U.S. exports of goods and services, to making fair treatment for American firms and international commerce. Uh, there's none of that here. So I'm not sure what to make of it. Here comes Bill's rant. Well, I can tell you which workers she's talking about. She's talking about union workers in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. That's what I was afraid of. That's who it's about. I happen to agree with her on the first half. In fact, my for those of, uh, those of you out there who also read my column, I think this is, I wrote about this either last week or the last or the week before. They all they all kind of blur together after a while. I, I think what we've learned is that, that trickle down doesn't really work in the U.S. economy, and that when President Kennedy was talking about economic policies, he said it, a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think what we've learned from globalization is that it doesn't lift all boats. It lifts it lifts the yachts of the rich people, but it doesn't lift the boats of the poor people. So I think they're on to a legitimate problem where I disagree with them and agree with Scott. I don't think they've developed a coherent response to how to deal with that. I mean, to me, the mistake from the beginning has been to assume that you can address social inequities and economic inequality entirely through trade agreements. And 
my view from the beginning has been that the agreements create benefits. They create more growth. They create more trade. They create more exports. There's also more imports coming in. How we distribute the benefits are really determined by other kinds of government policy. If you want to use a trade agreement to to redistribute benefits, which is what she talks about, you can try to do that through rules of origin that are discriminatory, basically, and force, as we did with USMCA autos, force value added to take place in, in specified locations in order to be eligible for whatever trade agreement benefits are available. That's just a, a small part of the total picture. And of course, it also ignores, as Scott said, that uh, their American workers are a diverse community. There are a lot of people, yes, they make steel, they make cars, they make a whole bunch of manufacturing equipment, but there's larger, a much larger number of workers in the services industry. And there are professionals and there's a lot of people who, even the ones that are making all those manufactured parts, they're making from imported components. So if you are in Boeing, you have hundreds, if not thousands of suppliers at various stages of your supply chain. And many of those stages are foreign. And so you've got American workers here making money, putting together parts that assembling parts that have come in from all kinds of places, Mexico, Canada, China, in some cases, and and elsewhere, and they're put together here, and then you know, eventually they end up in an airplane. Those workers don't seem to be on, on the list of people that we're worried about. We seem to be worried just about a smaller group of workers. But I guess what frustrated me about the whole thing is that there isn't really a coherent plan for, for how to fix that. I mean, they've been very clear about what they're not going to do. They're not going to negotiate trade agreements that involve giving other people more market access. What that means in practice is you're not going to negotiate trade agreements because if we won't, if we have nothing to give, then nobody else is going to give us anything. And that's played out in the IPEF. It's modest uh, at best. And, and the trade pillar is, is in purgatory or limbo, depending upon how you want to view these things. So I think on the whole, it's, it's been a disappointment, but I, I have to say that I think the initial thought that Agreements historically have been based on the idea that if you benefit big companies, it'll all trickle down to the workers. I think that's pretty much proven to be not true, but they really haven't come up with a solution to that. Well, look, nobody ever mentions growth, which is for me the the topic that's most important over the long haul. Open markets grow faster than closed. That's well known. But if you look at just the U.S. economy since the turn of the century, uh, we've grown at about 2% a year on average, real economic growth, okay? We chose an economic st- strategy and economic policies that have led to 2% growth. Had we chosen policies that have, would l- have led to an average 3% growth, every American would be $18,000 better off in their per capita income. I could use another eighteen grand. I could too, because the reason I put the number out is because that means a lot of people who are relatively poor are richer. Okay. Sure. One of the ways you help poor people is let them get rich. Okay. And so the, the obsession with chief executive salaries and this big business thing is a, is a complete misdirection of what really can be done with economic policy to generate growth that is broadly available to people. And as, as you put it, Bill, if you've got an extra $18,000 per, per capita to work with, you can, in, you can do a lot with social policy. You can do a lot with health policy. You can, you can, there's a lot of options you have as an elected official that you don't have if people are $18,000 poorer. So uh, for me, they, they just they missed the boat entirely. And as a result, I don't think it resonates. I don't agree with you on the executive salaries. If you've got workers making forty or fifty thousand dollars, and the CEO is making fifteen million, counting his stock options, I'm not sympathetic. And I don't think anyone's asking for sympathy, but I'm suggesting it misses the point from a policy standpoint. You ought to have a pro-growth policy and make poor people richer. You know, if I was making fifteen million a year, I would know what to do with that. Also. <laughs> You're not making $15 million a year, Andrew, here at CSIS? Andrew, 
<laughs> no, alas, you know, I, I'm a devoted public servant and down for good causes, as you guys are. And thank you for all this terrific insight today. We will be back next week with more Trade Guys. But in the meantime, thanks, guys. This was great. Thank you. To our listeners, if you have a question for the Trade Guys, write us at tradeguys at csis.org. That's tradeguys at csis.org. We'll read some of your emails and have the Trade Guys react to it. You've been listening to The Trade Guys, a CSIS podcast.